University of Washington are thrilled to be partnering with OSBI and some exemplary schools, one of which will be sharing their journey here with you today. Joining us are inclusion specialists from the Herring Center. My name is Jessica Flaherty and I'm gonna walk us through this first part of the webinar. Dr. Cassie Martin is here. I think I saw Naomi and uh, another Cassie. So, and then we have Molly Lyman here who's available to help you if you experience any technical issues. So before we dive in, let's just make sure that we're all set up for the webinar and have everything that we need. We always like to start by testing the audio in the left-hand corner menu, just checking to make sure everyone can hear us okay. We encourage you to share your comments and ideas in the chat. If you have any questions directly for the Brennan team or the Herring Center, please use the, the Q&A feature so that they don't get lost in the chat. So we will do our best to monitor the chat for any questions, but that Q&A feature really makes sure that we see what you're asking. Um, there will be a recording for today's webinar and it's gonna be provided on the Herring Center's demonstration sites webpage by the end of this week. As we move through this webinar, please keep in mind that we encourage a growth mindset where you're able and open to think about new ideas and willing to push yourself to grow. So thanks for joining us today and for being present, positive, and engaged. Let's take a second to share in the chat. So I really wanna know what impact you're hoping today's webinar will have on your school's inclusionary practices. So go ahead and share that in the chat with me if you're comfortable. So what impact are you hoping today's webinar will have on your school's inclusionary practices? Let's see, I think I can open it. Yeah, this, this information is gonna be helpful for us later uh, in future planning and stuff like that. Okay, well, if you're, if you're willing to share, share that in the chat and we can just keep that going and I'll go ahead and move on. A little background information on the Demonstration Sites Project. In the fall of 2019, OSBI launched the Inclusionary Practices Professional Development Project. The Herring Center partnered with OSBI to coordinate and lead this part of the larger statewide project creating model demonstration sites that highlight inclusionary practices across Washington State. The project was developed to provide educators from across the state with the opportunity to observe inclusionary practices in action, meet with school teams, collect artifacts that aid in systems change, and learn about how to implement inclusionary practices in different school contexts. Our demonstration sites highlight the diversity in our state, including urban schools, rural schools, and schools in some of our largest and smallest districts. In collaboration with the Herring Center, the original and future intention of this project is for demonstration sites to host visiting schools to showcase their high leverage inclusionary practices. By sharing these practices and opening their doors to teachers, administrators, families, and community members, it allows visitors to see best practices in action and apply them in their schools, while at the same time, the demonstration sites themselves continue to grow their inclusive culture and refine their practices that contribute to equitable learning for all students. Clearly right now we have some constraints around literally opening our doors, but we've been doing our very best to pivot to continue to provide transformational learning using virtual platforms like the one today. There are some founding principles that drive our work. In education, we tend to focus on the problems. Instead of examining what's working well, why it's working well, and how we can use that information to make things better. Taking an asset-based approach is a productive way for schools to leverage their strengths and to become more inclusive. Also, inclusion is a, not a special education initiative, but it's a cultural shift in philosophy and practice. If we simply change the way that we deliver special education services without considering the culture of the school or how all students engage in teaching and learning, we're never gonna make the changes that we need to truly impact student learning. 
Through the course of our webinars and virtual visits, districts, schools, and communities can learn more about what steps are taken to make these shifts to a more inclusive school. Something exciting about the demonstration sites is that they're in various stages of their journeys. So whether they're in year one or if they're, in, if they're six years in, they all have plans for continuous improvement. They recognize that as new students enter their buildings or join in virtually, and as they collect more information about the ways students learn, their professional practices need to reflect that learning in responsive and meaningful ways. We developed this project because we experienced the impact on visiting schools and seeing inclusionary practices in action. And we experienced the impact on our demonstration sites by hosting those schools. So before I hand it over to Brennan, I wanna see who's joining us today. So we're gonna pull up a little poll. Neat, that's a cool distribution. Seeing yeah, some teachers, like, administrators, yeah. specialists. Neat. Okay, well, so my time here is done. Super excited to, to hear the Brennan team. I think they have some, some cool stuff to share with you. So I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over. You're up, Trish. Oh, Trish, you're muted. What a great start I had for that. <laughs> anyway, thank you for joining us. I'm sorry I was muted. Um, I'm Trish Bether, the superintendent and principal of the school district. Uh, we're joined by Brittany Edwards, director of special services, Amanda Hoke, administrative assistant, and our well-loved school mom, Heidi Budnick, our middle school ELA and social studies teacher, and Elizabeth France, a third and fourth grade teacher. <laughs> Um, we're coming to you from Brennan, Washington, and a question we often get asked is, where is Brennan? Um, Brennan is located in South Jefferson County on the Olympic Peninsula. If you're driving down Highway 101 heading south, you'll start in Port Angeles and you'll work your way down. You'll come through Squim and Quilcene, then you'll hit Brennan, then you'll go to Hoodsport, Shelton, and finally Olympia. Um, the, com the community of Brennan has beautiful natural boundaries, which can become barriers to access. To the north is the Dosey Wallops River and Mount Walker. To the south is the Duckabush River. To the west are the majestic Olympic Mountains, and to the east is the Hood Canal. We share our community with two large local elk herd, the Dosey Wallops herd that you see there, and the Duckabush herd. It's, it's fun to look at them, and they spend lots of time on our playground, but it's not much fun to grow a garden when you share the community with those elk. Um, if you visit Brennan on a sunny weekend, you'll see that it's a playground for Western Washington. Brennan is a stunningly beautiful place to live and it's also very isolated. The population of Brennan is about 800. There are a large group of beautiful waterfront homes and there's also significant pockets of poverty. We have two restaurants, a gas station and a very small general store. Whitney Gardens and Pleasant Harbor Marina are tourist stops. It's a quiet town except for summer tourist and shrimping seasons. Living in Brennan also presents some challenges. Depending on where in Brennan you live, it's an hour drive to a grocery store or a medical facility. The closest access to those facilities is Port Townsend, Squim, Paul's Bow, or Shelton. Transportation is a challenge for some of our families. If you take the public transit to Port Townsend to go grocery shopping or to see a doctor, you have to get on the transit very first stop in the morning at 8.30, and you don't get a ride home until dinner time. So you have to be prepared to spend the entire day there. There are only two buzzes a day, and it makes for a really long day. Brennan is small, so we don't get a lot of data points on our specific community. Our last county report tells us that as compared to Kitsap and Jefferson counties, Brennan has 
the highest percentage of students qualifying for free and reduced meals, the highest percentage of child ab abuse cases accepted for investigation, and the highest percentage of families qualifying for TANF, or temporary assistance for needy families. Um, a unique part of our story is who we are. Um, if you look at our school picture, that tells you a lot. That's it, that's everybody. That's the bus drivers, that's the entire school staff. We are a one building school district. Um, we have about 84 students, preschool, our three-year-old preschool through eighth grade. And we also have a transitional, transitional kindergarten. About 80% of our students qualify for free and reduced meals. And this is our first year to participate in CEP or the Community Eligibility Program, which provides free meals for all students. Because of COVID guidelines and the extension of the summer meal program, all schools are able to do that. But moving forward, we will continue to provide free meals for all of our students. Um, our student population is more than 90% white. Most of our students attend Quilstein High School and we provide bus service to them daily. Our staff is small and we all wear many hats. Um, when we attend meetings and get out, schools talk about all the, the variety they have in their jobs, but we kind of add a new meaning to that. Um, I introduce myself as a super, superintendent principal and midday toilet plunger. Um, we have five full-time teachers, transitional kindergarten and kindergarten are grouped together. Then we have first and second, third and fourth, and five, six, seven, eight, create a little bit of a middle school program where one teacher teaches the math and science and one teaches the ELA and social studies. And we have a part-time preschool teacher. Um, we have a very small classified staff, part-time bus drivers that also assist with classroom duties, a kitchen staff member who cooks, serves, and manages. The business manager helps out with HR and other tasks. We have three classroom support staff members a part-time maintenance person, and three Washington Reading Corps members. Um, we contract out for most of our services, um, special education related with, e with our ESD. Um, we, we add a new definition to wearing many hats. Most of the reports and tasks that are required of a larger school district are also required of us, and it's quite a challenge. Um, one of the most important aspects of our little school is that we consider ourselves a school family. We have brothers, sisters, and cousins in the same classroom. 25% of our students are children of staff members. Um, we have been really lucky in this COVID-19 environment that we have been open since September 2nd with four in-person days each week. We had to briefly move to a more limited hybrid plan for the first three weeks in December but we're, we have all students in Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. And we have to, we've had many measures to make sure that we're able to continue to do that. And you can see some of those pictured there. Um, families have a remote option, but we only have a couple of families that are making that choice. We've not had any COVID cases related to the school and we hope that continues. And this model has really helped us to continue to make really strong academic progress. Um, I'd like to introduce Brittany Edwards, and she is our Director of Special Services, and she also wears a, a large number of hats. Brittany? Hi, everyone. It's nice to be here today. I'm kind of managing the slides while I'm also talking, so apologize in advance for any snafus. But I um, have been working here in Brennan for several years now. I started as the special education teacher and math teacher, and my role has kind of evolved from there. Um, we started looking at inclusionary practices for several reasons, primarily because we found that the progress the students were making was not ideal. We had these pullouts, we had special education, we were doing what we needed to do, but we just weren't seeing the progress that we wanted to see, and especially for students of that were at, considered at risk or students who had an IEP, students that um, really needed to make progress. Um, we were doing pullouts. When I first started, I was doing a pullout. It was a writing class for several students with an IEP and I called it the right stuff and we were going to do a, um, a really fun project but the problem is when you pull students out of class first they feel you know different they're sometimes embarrassed and then 
you put a bunch of students who are not good at learning, who don't enjoy learning together in a class, and it just tends to kind of blow up. Many of those students also have behavioral issues. So we just found it wasn't effective and we wanted to do something different. Um, we also started looking because the social emotional health and uh, needs of our students weren't being met. There were several issues that we were seeing. We didn't have a lot of after school activities to help students feel integrated and included in the school. And finally, our resources, you know, obviously are stretched thin. We all wear myriad hats and um, we all get overwhelmed and overworked quite a bit. So we needed to maximize our resources and be able to um, use what we had in more efficient ways and be smarter about how we did things. But ultimately, we want our students in this very small school to have the opportunity for an excellent education and to make remarkable progress. And sometimes the way out of poverty is an education, and that's what we hope to provide. And in addition to an education, we want them to have lifelong opportunities that allow them to be successful. So what did we find when we started looking? Well, students learn best in the general education classroom. That's what we found. Um, the core content experts are already there. They're teaching in the classroom. The students are collaborating with their peers. They're in the middle of it with their peers. They're with their friends. They're not separated from other kids. We found that the complex needs requiring, um, that the students required needed some creative thinking. We found that there weren't a lot of options in a tiny little town and we had to kind of broaden our perspective and come up with new and creative ideas on how to support these students. And we also found that other organizations in the area had programs that we didn't. And so that was a little bit surprising. And finally, we found that we can do more with less if we're just creative about it. If we find ways to push in services instead of pulling them out, if we find ways to support the teachers instead of just removing the students. Um, and we also found that when we did support the teachers, everyone in the classroom benefited from multi-grade classroom supports. So our journey of shifting our culture started to consider capitalizing on students' strengths. Our biggest change was going from the old adage of they just don't learn the same, they don't belong in this classroom because they can't understand and they don't get it and they can't keep up, to now we're talking about what can we do to keep these students in the classroom? What can we do differently? What are we doing that is alienating them or that's not helping them to learn? We had to change from a deficit model to a strengths-based model because every student has something to contribute and we need to build on those talents. We felt like every student should be in the classroom, that every student has something to give and that every student belongs together. We maintain our high expectations for all students we don't adjust the content that they learn or the expectations for assignments. But we also understand that one size does not fit all, that we need to adjust our allowances for students and our accommodations to help them be successful. It oftentimes requires us as teachers to step outside of our own expectations and norms and understand alternate viewpoints. So what we have to do is stop and ask ourselves, how can students grow even more with just a few additional supports? What can we do to help them feel engaged, accepted, safe in the classroom so that they can truly shine and show us what they know? Part of our journey was also shifting expectations, allowing teachers more autonomy in the classroom, but still maintaining a distributed leadership that supports what teachers need and makes changes to our structure on an as needed basis. So we don't have a scripted curriculum in our classroom. We don't have things that teachers must say. We do have board approved curriculum that we use. We do give teachers complete autonomy to use that as they feel appropriate. We have an administration who supports us and helps us brainstorm, helps us get the resources we need. We have an open door policy. If we ever need anything, we are always welcome. And one thing I will say about our administration is that they always will stop what they're doing, if possible, to listen to what you're saying and to allow you to 
express your needs. If, you know, Trish is great. If she needs some time for a meeting or if she's in the middle of something else, she'll say, you know, can you give me five minutes or can you come back in 10 minutes? And what's interesting is I'm also a mom. <laughs> I miss that part, but I have three kids at the school. And so they're in the middle of it. They're part of our school family. And before I was working at the school, I was a mom at the school. And I always found it very surprising that even as just a mom, whenever I'd come in and need to talk to Trish about whatever was going on with my kids at school, she would stop what she's doing. She'd invite me into her office. She'd have me sit down and she'd spend half an hour, hour with me if needed, because she is very open to making sure people express their needs and they feel heard and can address those needs. Um, one thing we do well um, with this distributed leadership um, is we make sure that we continue to collaborate as teachers. So everyone owns their own classroom, but we still have to work with each other to make sure that we have an overarching structure for the school. Students need to feel consistent going between class to class. So we use a lot of collaboration time to make sure we all are on the same page and know what's going on. So how did we start? How do we start with our inclusive practices? You know, I'll, I'll be honest, um, there was no planning. We don't have a consortium. We don't have a lot of people to form a, a research group or to come up with ideas. We literally just ripped the Band-Aid off. You know, we went from pullouts, let's try and get these kids what they need to, okay, every student is in the classroom, no exceptions, unless absolutely necessary. I think the few exceptions that we have are for students who need speech services or occupational therapy or other services that are specialty services that the general ed teacher can't provide. Um, so we just said, hey, you know, students are now in the classroom and it's hard. Let's figure out how to make it work. They're struggling, I can see that. What can we do differently? Can I bring in, you know, something different for you to help you get through it? You know, can they have more accommodations on the computer or can we bring in extra supports? Our key metrics for success was lots of support in the classroom because that's what we found students need to stay in the classroom. So the three most important practices for Brennan School that we found are first, students engaged in the core content standards. Every student is in the same core content at the same level with the same expectations. Also, family and community partnerships can be very strong and helpful commodities. And finally, we have to just be super flexible with our service delivery, especially being out here in Brennan where it's so remote and beautiful. We just have to be flexible in what we bring in, how we push out into the world, and what kind of opportunities and supports that we can provide. So uh, uh, Trish is going to talk to us about the first part, the first important practice of students engaged in core content. Um, we all recognize that having students engaged in core content was extremely important, but it's also expensive. Um, so we had to figure out how in the world are we gonna afford this? Um, one of the first thing we started to do was shifting our money from, we quit spending lots of money on big boxed curriculums. We have walls of giant art curriculum boxes and you know, 20 year old boxes of math books. And we quit spending money on those big box curriculums and all the boxes of trinkets. And we chose to add people to our classrooms instead. Um, we make really wise decisions about what we're going to spend money on curriculum wise. Um, so that freed some money up. The other thing that we've tried to do as a school family is really hit those facilities grants hard. We've applied for lots of grants to improve our school facility. And although you might think that has nothing to do with instruction, it really has everything to do with instruction because if we're not having to spend that, you know, tens and hundreds of thousands of dollars on our facility, that frees up money for people um, and for staff needs. Um, the other thing we did that's really been valuable is we applied for the Washington Reading Corps grant. Um, this is our fourth year to have Washington Reading Corps members in our school. And they work hand in hand, side by side with those classroom teachers really focusing on literacy. 
Um, it's a very inexpensive way to bring a great deal of support to your classrooms. Um, core content experts are teaching in those classrooms and that means all the students need to be in those rooms to benefit from that expertise. Um, students need more help and support in the classrooms and this the approach of having the kids in the classroom for core content really gives them the academic, academic support that they need. Um, so those are some tricks about how we afforded it. And then Heidi's gonna talk a little bit more about how we um, support our students um, in the core content in the classroom, keeping them there. Yes, thank you, Patricia. Um, Heidi Budnick, I have six children, five boys, I know. Five boys are still at home. Three were promoted from the eighth grade in the Brennan School um, to the Quilcene High School and two are currently enrolled. So it's a pleasure to be here today and thank you. Um, so we want our students to feel safe and at home in their classrooms. And in looking at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we do this at Brennan. We make sure and put a high emphasis on the quality and authentic care for each student. We see that each tier is met from physiological to safety, to belonging, to esteem needs, and then to real learning within the classroom. And one key here is that it has to be authentic and real caring for relationship building, trust, and positive human connection. Well, I guess, what does this really look like? So I don't think it's enough just to say, well, um, you know, we meet the students' needs by, let, let's say we wash their coats, which we do here. It's not enough to just say, well, we wash their coats, but what does that look like and what does that really mean? Um, so we should think about this. In the classroom, I'll ask, is there anyone who would like his or her coat washed? Raise your hand and I'll pick it up and run to the washroom and you'll have it back by outdoor recess time. So then I'm sneaking down to put the coats um, down the hallway in the washer and the dryer. And I'll even ask Amanda to even cover my room for five minutes. On the way to recess, I'm taking clothes out of the dryer and by, um, but the important thing is that it's inclusive to everyone and to all. So this is the inherent backbone attitude of our little, stu our little school doing a big job. All kids feel cared for, special, and they all share that moment collectively and individually. That's what's most important. It's very calm and peaceful, and it leaves a residue imprint of trust and authenticity within the classrooms. We fix shoes, we all duct tape rain boots, and I have shoe glue in the third drawer of my teacher's desk. This is our norm. We have even found someone going to Walmart to buy shoes by the end of the day or by the end of the week. And Walmart is at least an hour, an hour and 10, 15 minutes away from here. Um. I, I will say that um, if I can jump in a little bit, Heidi is very good about impacting each one of these layers. And I think she's gonna go into it, but she very specifically makes sure students feel safe and belong and they have an esteem. She, she figures out what they need. I'll let you continue, Heidi, but she does a fabulous job with each one of these tiers. Thank you, Brittany, thank you. Um, but I think it's really important that whatever the needs are, that as a collective staff, we will solve them. We will put our thinking caps on for the tough ones and co collectively and individually in our classrooms, see that all the students' needs are met so that true learning can be experienced and hopefully enjoyed by everyone, and including me. It's fun to have to just really come to school and enjoy it and enjoy the moments that we share together. Our hope is to be lifelong learners. All the teachers cultivate sa a safe and sense of belonging, belonging with the classrooms. I greet students at the door and see how they're feeling um, and even how they look in the morning. How are they coming into the classroom? And do they need to check in with the counselor first because he or she is coming in upset or sad? 
And our principal usually engages students who might need an uplifting check-in for a type of chat with them. And that has been so helpful. We discuss, learn, and take time for how students can identify how he or she is feeling. And further, we all teach techniques to that kids can work through those feelings, like having space, think time, where a teacher may not be directly calling on that student in the middle of classroom if they just need to have some quiet time. Maybe they can journal, or maybe they can draw for a few minutes at their desk. So this modeling, um, these are not only single events, but they're also part of our conversation that happens all year long with every student. This models building relationship and doing life together in the classroom. I share with the students early on that we are on both a collective and individual learning continuum. And we're all on different places on that continuum. We celebrate students and who they are as people, not just acceptance. This helps them to appreciate and value their peers around them. So students engaged in core content. Um, this year, because of COVID-19, we chose Teams. It's a digital platform to use school-wide. Now teachers use this technology within the classrooms. We use it for setting up rotation stations, so pods of learning stations within the class classroom, along with effective progress monitoring and accessibility to all. We like Teams because it taught students real world skills they need for success in high school and even beyond. We started putting Teams down um, as training and experience for our seventh and eighth grade resumes for their transition to high school plans. And we find that businesses use Teams and we hope that this will teach those real life skills. Teams is wonderful because it's truly an all inclusive to all students. It has speech to text, text to speech, highlighting parts of speech within the text, line by line reading along with the text, and there's so much more. So many students with say IEPs with reading and writing, they can learn this, these programs and use them and use them right along their peers, which is so important. Um, so everyone is using the same thing. And matter of fact, we went through the Microsoft training videos so that anyone, and that's an anyone in the classroom, can use these tools and teams. So it was based on preference. If somebody wanted to read line by line, they could. You didn't need an IEP. And it really helped bring our classrooms together and it made students really feel good about themselves. It gave confidence. Um, I wanted to interject real quick quick because Heidi talked all about the fabulous supports that are integrated in Teams for ELA, but there's also what they call Ink to Math that I'm use, I will be soon yeah. using in my classrooms where you can literally write with a stylus pen on a touch screen what you think your math equation will be and it will translate that into a typed version of that and then it will give you helps on how to solve that equation, different things like that. So there are literally supports in every subject for in Teams, and I think she mentioned it doesn't require an added cost for additional applications to be installed. It's all just integrated, it works seamlessly, and it's pretty fantastic. Yes, thank you, Brittany. Um, also, um, we do purchase digital curriculum along with the classroom materials. Teams was really effective during, uh-oh, my computer is glitching. Can you still hear me? We can still hear you, Heidi. Okay, so I'm just gonna keep going because my computer is going from on to off. And then Brittany, I'll just cue you for the yeah. next because I, I won't be. Sure. Um, okay, so um, COVID-19, yes, we had um, our whole middle, most of our middle school staff out, but learning was able to continue in the classroom with teams. Teachers could load up teams from home and then the substitute could implement the materials within the classroom. This was very effective um, when we were both out. Maybe yeah, it was actually Heidi and myself. And I just want to clarify, we did not have the virus, but our children right. presented with symptoms and they weren't, it's a long story, but we both ended up having to be out to get tested at the same time. 
and we were both able to continue our classroom we were out and the class was in it was kind of reverse it was a little bit funny <laughs> yeah both our families were both out <laughs> but we were we were able to load up teams and keep going so um it's been revolutionary that way and we're able to uh, respond to students' questions through chat. The, and so I've been in class right now with an online group um, and then teaching at the same time, but then somebody will give me a chat. And so I'll know, okay, that's come through because you get um, notices. And so then I'll know, okay, right after this class, I'm gonna go chat that student and see what that student needs. So it's been effective in multi-dimensional ways within the classroom. Um, it's been very effective. Um, Many teachers, okay, so the hard thing, the downside is that with Teams, or of course with um, something like that, what happens when the power goes out? It's been, um, that's that's the, the downside, is at Brennan, you have to be creative. Our minds are always on the go to adapt, to enjoy learning, and to make progress collectively and individually with all the students. So I will say we have lost power quite a few times this year with all the snow. And sometimes even when we have power, our internet tower is up on Mount Jupiter on the hill and it gets way more snow than we do. So even if we're in school and we have power, we could lose internet at any given moment, which we have had happen many times this year. So you do still have to be flexible and have your backup paper options, something to do for that day if, you're, if you don't have internet, if you don't have power. But for the most part, we can rely on on this digital platform to be consistent, accessible, and available at any location for our classrooms. It has been phenomenal. I will agree with Heidi. Okay, um, students engaged in core content. Well, before COVID-19, um, we had every other Friday being a half day for staff meeting, collaboration, and professional development. And Currently, we meet every other Wednesday. Um, we usually have certified staff meetings with our counseling group um, that comes over and supports our students called Jumping Mouse. And we have this so that we can support each other. It's on our professional development days. Um, teachers, certified teachers get together. Um, we get together and we, we come up with ideas on what students might need to have success. So if we're struggling or if we need some ideas or we tried things, we can go to our uh, jumping mouse groups and say, hey, this is what's happening. Do you have suggestions? Um, we routinely ask ourselves school-wide, what does this student need? I mean, that's probably the most important question we ask. Then we collaboratively discuss and bring up ideas and usually the teacher who has that student will go with an idea that seems to settle um, with her the best and try that. Then we come together the, in the next two weeks for a meeting for debriefing to see how it went or to get more ideas. So in one meeting, it could just be as simple as this. One um, from a teacher who had my student last year, so they progressed up the school years, um, I tried a sticky note at the beginning of, a mor of the morning, just a little sticky note, put it on the student's desk, and it was a little word of encouragement just for that student. Uh, have a nice day. I'll work with you for your writing assignment today. Um, best wishes, Miss V. And this, this little simp simple sticky note worked miracles for writing a version. And this student just got right to work. And that is amazing. That's just a simple idea. Um, we, share, we share resources and build community in our small community. Our invisible footprints that we leave around the school have individual paths with areas of crossing that leave an inherent culture school-wide. So we're leaving this culture of trust, collaboration, community, sharing, respect, honor, integrity, and grit. So I once I once had this student, and this is kind of the backbone of our school, but you don't see it. And this one student, um, have notes here, what she said. She said, we were in the middle, we we're just gonna take a test. It might've been one of our state tests. And she goes, Miss B, what, what if I'm low on grit for the test? 
And so then this other student turned around real quick and she goes, bar and bind for today. And you know, isn't that so true? It's, it's so true and so real for the nitty gritty of how we live life here. Um, that's the kind of community heart that we all share and it's just unseen. However, our lives and footprints day in and day out speak and keep on speaking. Um, now we're gonna hear from Amanda on community partnerships. Thank you so much. Family and community partnerships, ways to work with the community. So we're interested to know the different ways that you collaborate with your community. How do you reach out? If you would please share in the chat um, with us how you reach out to others. Um, I'm gonna introduce myself really quick. So I'm Amanda Hoke. I have uh, five children, two of which um, attend Quilcene, three of which attend Brennan. Um, I have been in multiple roles, but I'm currently the administrative assistant. I've been a substitute teacher and then a para, and now I am the, the person who answers the phones and greets the kids um, when they come in and need a Band-Aid or need an ice pack or um, just, I don't know, you can find me anywhere. Okay, so... Does and any... Actually, I will say our students take advantage of that many times a day. Like they'll check in with Miss Amanda, just go give her a big hug. Or I have students that frequently say, I need to go get an ice pack because my arm hurts. And I have a feeling it's just because they need to go check in with Miss Amanda because <laughs> <laughs> Miss Amanda always makes it better. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so I don't see that I don't see anything in the chat. Okay. Amanda's checking the chats, but if we don't have anything yet, we can move on and, and circle back to them. Okay. Yep. It is. It would be interesting to know, though, like how others reach out to their communities, because we feel like the community integration is a pivotal point, a key part of our whole infrastructure. Okay. Okay, family and community partnerships. Parent-teacher conferences are a time to to dive deep into individual student learning plans. We discuss prog progress and accomplishments and come together behind goals and expectations. So as a parent, um, I appreciate Brennan. Um, we were um, an active duty military family before we came to Brennan. And so um, our middle child has been in five different school districts, Brennan being the fifth. And so um, he's been a part of very large classrooms where he's just a he's just another face and just another child and when we came to Brennan it felt like he was he was a person not that he's not a person in other schools but he was like he had a face and he had a name and the teachers like they didn't just like know who he was um in his seat because he's very that one is very quiet but he like she the the teacher dove in and was and found books for him to read that in, that he liked and got his attention and helped him with reading and and so when I sat down at parent-teacher conferences, um, she had more to say to me than just the fact that like, oh yeah, he's just super great. I don't have any problems with him. And um, and so it was really great to um, to sit down for the first time in, a th in like four years of him being in school um, and have um, a teacher like actually understand my child as a person. And this is a kid who didn't speak to a teacher for the first six months when he went to kindergarten. And so then to get here, not only was he super shy, but like she had already like unpacked all of that. And so for me as a, as a parent, um, I continue to appreciate the fact that all of my kids are known by all of the staff, but especially by their teachers, they take the time to just get to know each of their students individually and know what they need help with, know where their strengths are. And um, also one of the things that I really like about the um, parent-teacher conferences is that my kids sit down and make goals too. And and um, so we have the like, this is what the teacher is going to do, but the this is what the student says that they wanted to work on for this semester and then I as a parent can help and so that's something that I've appreciated over the last several years as we've been here. 
I, I did want to say I have a similar experience when I first moved here as a parent. Um, my oldest was in first grade and his kindergarten year was not great. We were in another large school district and he was just another student in the class. The teacher was not willing to make a lot of accommodations and he was struggling. He escalated his behaviors because he wasn't integrating into the class and it was it was a mess. So we came up here and, you know, he started first grade, the same old, same old. And I think he got to know Miss Bethard, our superintendent, very well that year. She did a lot to help integrate him back into the classroom. She didn't just pull him out because he was misbehaving and give him detention and make him sit there. But she would try and assess and figure out what was wrong. And he, she would try and work with him to get him back into the classroom. Oh, you don't feel good again today? Okay, well, how about you sit there for 10 minutes and then we'll call your mom. And as a mother, I really appreciated that, that she was trying to really understand my my child and he's now in sixth grade and he still uses his trish time <laughs> to his benefit he'll go and check in with trish and just sit there and talk and talk and talk about grilled cheese <laughs> or about whatever's on his mind and then he's like okay i'm going back to class and then he goes back to class and you know it's just phenomenal the impact that knowing each student individually can have I I have enjoyed my time with your baby, and he uh, we had a long talk yesterday, and he had a wonderful day. We benefit from staff that are local and invested in the community. Many have a deep have deep community roots. We have general pride in our little school. We cherish our wall of fame, our gen, our original water crock, and the historical pictures. Uh, we, we have a lot of fun. Um, our wall of fame is um, pictures over the years of all the graduating eighth grade classes. And so we go, we, our family goes through, I'm sure others do too. We go find people in the community that we know attended here and it, that's fun. <laughs> Sometimes you can find the moms of students on the wall. So like, you know, you have a student now and their mom is on the wall. You go check it out. <laughs> With that pride comes responsibility. We try to showcase our accomplishments while recognizing the importance of history. We try to do our, our part to invest in our community. Our, sm our small students sing an every year in the Senior C Center Christmas Luncheon. We bring the community together for a fall festival and a large auction event every year. Our students march and sing in the annual Brennan Loyalty Day Parade and visit our local fire station annually. This, the students love it when the firemen come in and eat lunch with them. We are a school family that is deeply ingrained in the community. We strongly believe that our children learn best when their needs are being met. And you've heard a lot about that. Um, there are prerequisites to learning though. We evaluate the needs of each student and we ask ourselves, what do you need to be ready to learn? Um, as I came to Brennan in this role six years ago, when I began to go to meetings, I realized that neighboring districts had many services that we did not. Um, they were having lots of county provided services and we had zero. Um, our demographic data that I shared with you indicates that we may have the greatest need and we were receiving no outside services. So um, I, uh, began to tell the story of our little school district um, at every opportunity I had. I, and I think as a school family, we began to share that same story. We did not miss an opportunity. We outlined the very special needs of our school and uh, we did it in a very polite manner. And then some great things began to happen. Um, because of our poverty and our remote location, our families have difficulty getting counseling services. They can go in for one time things, but going every week and making that long trip, it just, it isn't happening. The first time in more than 20 years, we have counseling provided by the county. We actually have a lot of counseling provided by the county. We have two days of jumping mouse therapy, which is um, provided for our younger students, and that is healing through play. And we have two more days of more traditional school counseling. We, um, so we have four days total of counseling. We pay for one of the days and the other three are paid for through the Mental Health Advisory Board, which allocates one-tenth of 1% 1 of sales tax. I think that other counties have similar boards. Um, 
What this really means for our school students in Brennan is that any child who needs counseling can get it for free. Um, for the first time in many, many years, the Smile Mobile, which is a mobile dentist, comes to Brennan. They come every spring. I think they're coming next week. And they provide free dental services for our students and then community members aged 0 to 18 and pregnant moms as well. Um, when I first talked to them, to them, they really weren't sure they could make the trip. They weren't sure our community was big enough to where it would be worthwhile and they could see enough people. Um, Every year they've come, it's really been the opposite problem. They're seeing, you know, 14, 15 year olds that have never been to the dentist and they're so booked and packed that they're feeling bad and they're leaving before they're able to finish. Um, so the, the Smile Mobile has been one of those things that really helps our kids come healthy and ready to learn. Um, we also began to notice that other districts have had after school programming. Um, provided by the county and other organizations. We did not have any after-school programming. Um, the local, one of, one of our local churches came in one day a week and did something you know, through the church, but we had no after-school programming. Um, as we began to tell our story, um, WA, WSU Extensions and 4-H stepped in and they've been providing after-school programming three days a week for our students. Um, for the last few years, the first time in memory, the YMCA has been coming and providing a summer literacy program. They've already contacted me about coming this summer. Um, 4 HWSU and the YMCA, once again, were hesitant. They thought, well, we really can't come to Brennan. There aren't enough kids. It's not gonna be worth our trip. You know, we have to go to the bigger places. Um, and when they got here, they realized that the problem really wasn't that there weren't enough children. It's that they had to hire additional staff. Um, and they just had to figure out a way to afford that because in Brennan, almost all of them come to those things. If we say summer school is optional and we're gonna have a summer literacy play, play summer school, huge numbers of them come. I, um, and I think Trish, part of that is your dedication to making sure families are aware of the opportunities and that they take full advantage of those opportunities. You know, I when think I, that's a good point, Brittany. Uh, like when the Smile Mobile comes, we yeah. want to make sure that they're that they're packed and full so that they will come back. So right. Amanda and I call every single family that attends school. We look at the community and make outside calls and invite them to, to come to the Smile Mobile. And then we we make lots of phone calls inviting families to come to these after school and summer activities. One of the other things that we've done that's really been great for kids is uh, providing swim lessons. Uh, Brittany really started that her first year. When I first met Brittany, she was a mama and then she was PTO president and she organized free swim lessons from the YMCA. And we used to load the kids up on the bus and they've got six free swim lessons and squim, which was more than an hour away. So it was not easy, but um, but we're surrounded by water on three sides. And so, and lots of them can't swim. And now we're co coordinating with the marina to where it's the YMCA comes to our little local marina and we just give the swim lessons there. But um, we have organizations that will, just this last year, I, I saw a flyer that said, um, listed some local areas that they were gonna provide Christmas gifts for kids. Well, Brennan wasn't on the list, so, a local organization, Jefferson County Public Health, stepped up and provided just piles of Christmas gifts for our kids. Um, so I think when you begin to tell your story, um, whatever that is, that can be a tool to help you reel in services. And then we try to pay back. Our kids write beautiful thank you letters. We publish thank yous in our local community, little newsletter from the Brennan community and in our school newsletters. Um, so we try to make sure that we really recognize and learn to say thank you. Um, we found that our community really wanted and needed these services. And they've made that evident by the way they have uh, responded and attended. Amanda? Before I move on to my slide, um, Julie Byler, um, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your last name. She mentioned in the, the um, chat that um, she says, we are a tribal community, so everything about the schools is known by all, which we, we have that here too. Um, but she also said that the tribe, is, the tribe has provided a group that works within the school to help support different tribal values. That's, re that's really cool. 
That's really neat. Thank you for sharing, Julie. Um, so family and community partnerships, um, enriching the classroom experience. So Jefferson Healthcare provided a participatory grant for our middle school. It was a learning process. The students planned for our new water bottle filling station. And so I actually have a student in the middle school class um, that um, participated in that. And it was really, really neat as a parent too, like not only as admin to like watch it happen within the classroom and hear from the teacher, but then to like go home and have conversations with my student who was like super excited about the fact that like, our class gets to vote on this and we get to decide what we get to do with this and to watch the whole process. And he, you know, Heidi gave everybody the little, I voted stickers because they all had their little <laughs> vote. And he thought it was so neat that he got to, to be a part of that and actually like, and then this year get to see it be and, and use it. What I thought was great about that is there was a whole process and Heidi managed it beautifully. Miss B, she's our middle school ELA teacher. And there was a requirement that they had to have a vote and they had to set it up and they had to write, you know, for the different options, what they wanted. And all the students wanted the water bottle filling station bad enough that they, their only other option was something that was just completely ridiculous. It was a basket weaving, <laughs> you know, and, it, and so they, really convinced everybody that the water bottle filling station is what they wanted. But Heidi did a fantastic job with that process. Mm -hmm. The county library sends out the bookmobile every week. The, the Dosey Wallop State Park staff comes to the school to provide classroom and summer school nature lessons. They sponsor a beach cleanup activity for students. Our own staff jumps in to provide the movie making club, which all, all always has a very long waiting list and run club, which includes the coveted captain roles. And yes, they submit the resumes for their ver this very important position. Our students live in a small rural community, but we want to give them some big world experiences in many ways. These are things they write about, talk about and plan for. Amanda, I wanna say one thing is, I don't know if everybody knows what a bookmobile is, but we have this county library in Port Townsend, um, Hadlock area, and they come they before COVID, they'd come out here uh, every week, and all the classrooms would have their scheduled time. And I can't tell you how exciting it was as a teacher because we go out our side door, beautiful sunny day, and we'd all go. It's like a big motor home on wheels, the bookmobile, and it was exciting. And the kids would get their weekly books and drop off and pick up. And, and they became uh, very important to the kids. They'd have conversations and they'd look forward to seeing the librarian and, and say, well, how are you today? And they'd learn these social skills of saying hello and how are you back? And it was so much fun to see that growth in that area. So it was so much fun to have the bookmobile um, weekly. And it was school-wide, school-wide, so. Mm -hmm. well, and you say social skills, and I think of um, um, helping students, um, when I was a para helping a student, they were looking for something particular, but they didn't necessarily know to ask. And I would say, well, why don't you go ask them? And so it's them learning to ask other people outside of their comfort zone a little bit questions uh, and to get help from other people and that, hey, you can request books and they'll then they'll they'll order them for you or whatever it is that and then they show up on the bookmobile and it's lots and lots of social skills through that. But I know that Elizabeth uses the bookmobile in her classroom. She works with the librarian directly and says, mm -hmm. this week we're studying this topic. Can you bring some books to the bookmobile about that topic so students can choose books to read? So it's really great. Yeah, can you guys hear me now? Okay. Okay, good. Um, yeah, they will ask me what we're studying in science. So if we're doing a unit on the rock cycle, they will send me a whole bunch of books all about different rocks and the process and volcanoes. And uh, the kids really do enjoy it. It's like Christmas when they get their um, requested books in. And yeah, it keeps them excited and uh, helps our, our library system is big and um, has a great support for us. Mm -hmm. Each classroom becomes a family within the school family and we work to support those school and home family needs. 
We wash coats and allow our families to use our laundry facility. We provide hygiene products as needed. We use our Title I funds to purchase shoes. We coordinate with the Brennan, Boeing, Bluebells, and World Vision to provide warm coats for all of our students. We work to create an overall sense of taking care of one another in academics and beyond. We apply for funding from OSPI for the fresh fruit and vegetable program, which provide each student with a healthy snack each day and the OSPI funding for after school snacks so we can support our students and after school providers. It is important to make sure we are addressing all needs, including life needs outside of the classroom. Um, just really quick. Um, so my husband was deployed last week because although he's not active duty, he is National Guard and he was um, deployed last year, I should say. I think I said last week, it was last year. And it was really cool to see um, the teachers not only, um, you know, asking me how we're doing, but they were, you know, checking in with my kids. And so they were, they were trying to make sure that my kids through that were, their needs were met. And that's, that's just like a personal, they do that all the time. But for us, that was a pretty big thing. Um, some of my kids have been through that before, but some of them did not remember that experience. So it was wonderful to have teachers and other faculty checking in, checking in and really caring for my students during that time. This degree of care levels the playing field for everyone. This is our class. This is our family. We all need to feel safe. There is honor, respect, dignity all across the school. Elizabeth is our third and fourth grade teacher. She is going to talk to you about flexible service delivery. All right, can you guys hear me or see me? Okay, having a little difficulties with our computer, but we're going to keep pressing on. We have grit, right, Heidi? Okay, going in a whole nother room, but we got this. Thank you. Okay, so our flexible service delivery. <laughs> well, we have to be flexible in uh, the way that we provide services. We have a very small staff and a tight budget. So we've learned how to optimize the members of our staff. Everyone pitches in to fill the needs of our school. Our wonderful transportation director drives bus and does recess duty, grant work, brings all the breakfast to the classrooms for the next day and works in the classroom. And in the classroom is what we are seeing is really exciting with all this support that we're getting. The paraprofessionals and reading core members are in the general education classrooms providing invaluable classroom support. Reading core takes a lot of paperwork and cooperation with the organization, but we have found that it is well worth it. I have a reading core member in my classroom who gives my struggling readers extra lessons that I would otherwise be unable to administer. And we are both seeing the difference in these students and the students see it too. So that's what makes it even extra exciting for everyone. And Elizabeth, I think one of the, my joys of the day is watching your Reading Corps member get so much joy and reward from his work with the students. He's new at this and he's just, He's just loving it. Okay, I'm gonna move on to uh, flexible services that we are providing and bringing experiences into the classroom. Okay getting our slide up. So our flexible services and bringing experiences in, because we live in Brennan, uh, we have physical and sometimes economic barriers. Few students have the opportunity to go to a museum or zoo. So we bring these wonderful resources and activities to Brennan, things like Burke Museum, Reptile Man, Museum of Flight, Bricks for Kids, Pacific Science Center, Mobile Plantarium, which I heard was really fabulous. I wasn't here to see it, but I hear about it. Um, 
We've had author visits, very uh, tail wagon tutors is where a community member brings a, a very sweet dog in where the little younger kids will read to the dog and um, they all uh, give her cards and stuff. I think her name was Tracy or something like that. All the kids know though. We build these enrichment opportunities that link what they are learning to the real world and engages students. We encourage student voice when selecting these events where students ask questions and explore their own individualized interests. It builds community through experiences. They'll compare ideas and dive into subjects deeper on their own and talk about it together long after the experience is over. So I guess the experience isn't really over, it's, it continues with them and in their memories for a long, long time. Um, the barriers that we uh, discussed in our location uh, doesn't keep us from getting out. We enjoy going to the Ducka Bush Reserve. We go to Camp Parsons and to other near areas in our county, like Fort Townsend Museum of History, Twi Twisters, Gymnastics, and even a little farther out, we'll go to Barnes and Noble, where uh, middle school goes to see what that store is and the beautiful books that are piled to the ceiling. Wild waves and fancy restaurants are some of the field trips our kids take. Field trips take a lot of hard work, but the school is committed to giving these experiences to our students. Um, sometimes to get to Seattle to something really amazing like the Museum of Flight, uh, with 20 or so middle schoolers, we have uh, overnight trips to make those happen. So some of the panelists can raise their hands if they've ever slept on the floor for Brennan stu school students. Yeah, that'd be Trish and Amanda, I think, are probably raising their hands if you can't see them. So with creativity, we get over the challenges uh, that we face and um, we get Brennan students to be able to go anywhere. <laughs> we go to these places with um, purpose. I mean, the mm -hmm. reason why we went to the Barnes and Nobles is because we were talking about probably an author, we're talking about books, the Barnes and Nobles came up and there were like three or four kids the first year. And they said they, we all, they all thought that was a dry cleaning facility. And so, you know, with that, we just, we talked about it. We said Barnes and Nobles is this big, you know, retail store for books. And so I talked to our principal and then we, we took an outing and, and Barnes and Noble made it wonderful. We had hot cocoa. We went on a scavenger author book hunt throughout all the Barnes and Nobles while it was open. And we, we took the extra staff needed to go. And then we learned about um, how an author writes a book and then how, what happens when it, uh, goes to Barnes and Noble and, and what their business is like. So it was absolutely wonderful. When we went to uh, Keyport Naval Base, I always have to chuckle because we, we boarded a sub, which is a 40, 25 foot ladder going straight down the opening of the submarine to the base of the floor. And you have to be very careful, but we took our um, sixth, seventh and eighth grade students um, and answered lots of questions and, and did the, um, uh, they, they even, where they drive a submarine, not drive it, but um, their model of a submarine. And then they, they got to pull everything and read equipment. And they were very, you know, what kind of education and jobs and training, it was very exciting. But I always have to laugh at how we got there because somebody said, can we have subs on a sub? And I thought, well, let's think about that. And, and we got pretty close. We got the, uh, uh, the Navy Admiral got ice cream for everybody in their um, dining hall with uh, hamburgers and all you could eat there. And then we went and got to tour one of the Navy base submarines. So that was very exciting. And then our um, wonderful uh, school board member is retired from there. So it was wonderful that we had our school board that went with us on that trip. So we've had some very exciting field trips and um, it's, it's just wonderful experience in bringing uh, 
people to our school and then venturing out. And I think life in Brennan is, is quite an adventure. I, I was actually part of the um, trip to the Museum of Flight. And part of that uh, adventure was bringing them into our school for everyone to have access to their um, activities and their STEM processes. And then we took the middle school to the Museum of Flight and that's over by Boeing in Seattle. So you can imagine it's a very long trip, but they had the option for us to sleep over and we thought that would be a fantastic adventure. It was very much an adventure. But the students were able to perform scientific experiments and activities and they were able to get inside of these planes and see what it meant to fly a plane. And they were able to see inside of the engineering and how the wires all ran through. And it was really a fantastic way to expose our students to different types of careers or job opportunities or experiences in life. And so they could see what's out there and they're not limited to our small town. And I will say, I brought my own cot because I, I can't do the floor, but it was still really interesting to sleep in this huge room on a cot with middle schoolers all around you and you stare up and there's a huge plane hanging from the ceiling and you see all these little, you know, displays around and some of them, you know, are going off at night because they're a little radio and they have, and so it kind of startled us the first time, but the students will always remember that. And some of them were inspired to maybe look into it more and they still talk about it. So it was fantastic. So back to you, Amanda. <laughs> or Heidi, I'm, no. Elizabeth. <laughs> yep, me. <laughs> okay, I'm moving on to counseling services. Okay, thank you. Going from absolutely no counseling to having every student who wants or needs counseling was able to get it. Um, our counselors are here a couple times a week and sometimes um, the child is, is most every time the child is deeply impacted. They feel cared about deeply because they have another person, their counselor, who is ex investing time and showing uh, that they're interested in them personally and, and investing energy. And it does make a difference for their learning. Our counselors engage with family members and there are supporting families, and this can di directly improve our community and our students. Students who are having their needs met are more successful. These counselors are part of our school family. We work very closely together. Um, while maintaining confidentiality, we can share issues or concerns that we can all watch for during sessions. And the counselors participate in IEP meetings and teams. They help us to better understand the students that we are serving. It all comes together to give a very individualized picture of each child so that we can make a plan that is tailored to fit their specific needs. The jumping mouse works with um, the younger children and the MCS counseling takes our older children and they work case by case and are taking on pretty much a full load and we're very grateful for them. Okay, so Brittany is going to... Brittany, one more thing. Yeah. I'm counseling, I've really, and school-wide, it's been so successful especially counselors coming in and being a part of our classrooms and helping teachers build positive relationships. How do you connect with that student? And, and I mean that student by any student, you know, just the one in front of you that you're trying to build that relationship with. And so it can be challenging and we have students who are challenging or have uh, you know, socio-emotional IEPs, and it can be challenging. And so, you know, staying in the classroom and having counselors see, okay, what's happening in the environment and, and, and give us ideas. And sometimes it's ideas in the now. It can be um, they are here, it's a passing in the hallway or, you know, come see me in my room for a few minutes. I've got to ask you a question. And, you know, how do we make those connections with students that give the students success and help teachers help the students? And so I find it just, just um, 
extremely needed and, and successful having them here and part of the classroom and part of the school and supporting the students individually and supporting the parents and the students. So it's multidimensional. I agree that it has been instrumental in helping teachers, including myself, make connections with even some of the more difficult students who don't want those connections. They can help us understand where the behaviors are coming from and what might be a good uh, reaction to those behaviors or other types of interventions that they may need. And in addition, they've come into the classroom as a whole. This is where we say every student participates. So every student is interacting with this counselor and they bring in the social emotional learning into the classroom, things like zones of regulation or you know, social stories or whatever that particular counselor is working on with the students. And they will build the entire school community with these skills and then you know individually with the students that they see and it is important that every student has that opportunity to see a counselor if they want and we have that opportunity to have counselor interventions in extreme cases when needed so it's it's been a real boon to our school and so as we continue on our journey as was indicated in the beginning, you know, we're just starting with our inclusionary practices and this can take years to master. And we know that we have areas to continue to grow, right? We wanna continue bringing professional development into our school and build on the learnings that we already have and reach out to find new and creative ways to reach our students. Um, we are constantly evaluating our processes, evaluating our interactions with students to understand how we can change, how we can more appropriately meet their needs and just continually reflecting on our, our processes. Um, every year brings new students with unique needs and so we, wanna, we want to um, make sure that we accommodate those. Um, we have our student study teams. We have very, um, protected time for teacher collaboration. And we've talked about this a little bit already where teachers come together, they talk about students. Some of the teachers have had them in the past. Other teachers have ideas about what to do, but also we talk about their learning. The student isn't really understanding the math. Well, they might need more manual manipulatives, not this year because of COVID, but, or sometimes it's helpful for them to color their own um, graphic organizer. Like if you give them the fraction worksheet, let them draw it out or color it instead of just giving them a color version. Or this student will work better with a peer. So if you put them with this particular friend that doesn't get sidetracked with conversations, you know, so things like that, protecting the time for teacher collaboration is critical. Um, and of course, we're continuing with our new focus of what do they need to stay in the classroom? Let's not just take them out if, if it's hard, let's figure out what else can we do to keep them in the classroom. And then finally, with our digital platform, there's so much more to learn, so many more places to go and explore with that to improve our collaboration, to improve access to core content, and to really give these students real world skills. I talked a little bit about the ink to math opportunity. We haven't quite gotten there yet because we're still trying to get our tech in place. It's another story, but when we get there, they can take this ink to math in one note anywhere they go. If they need help in math and they're home without a teacher and they're, you know, they're struggling, they can go to this ink to math in high school, in college, wherever they are, and they write in the equation. It'll help them solve it and help them understand how to get there. Um, things like learning Microsoft Word for their writing essays or argumentative papers or presentations in PowerPoint. It was interesting, um, at the beginning of the year, I had all of the students, Teams is brand new, so I was trying to get all the students on Teams, help them understand how to navigate it, help them understand how to create a document in there. So I gave them a template of a get to know me kind of thing, you know, first day of school, who are you, what are your interests? And we all know them already, of course, but they still love filling it out. And I put it in PowerPoint on Teams, and I realized after they started that I hadn't included any text boxes in there. <laughs> I thought, oh, this is gonna be a disaster. But it wasn't because they've already had technology classes with one of our other um, classified staff members where they already learned PowerPoint. So they know PowerPoint. They can generalize that to any situation they're in when they get into high school or college and they're making presentations. They'll have these skills to be able to take with them. 
And so lots of potential there and we're gonna continue growing and continue building our inclusive practices with the key mindset of how can we support our students in the general education classroom? And that is what's really critical. So Trish has some findings and data to go over with us that are really pretty amazing in my opinion. Um, you know, the most important, th one of the most important things that our students make excellent progress and we don't rely on gut feelings or just generalized assumptions. We use a number of high quality tools to measure this progress. We meet, we talk about school student progress, we brainstorm ideas for areas where we think that certain students or certain subjects are not where they need to be. Um, it's, a, it's a topic of conversation, a frequent topic, um, something we plan to discuss. Uh, we won a big OSPI award. Uh, we, were, um, we were recognized for our students making remarkable student progress and closing opportunity gaps. Um, we were the only school district in our, um, in our Highway 101 corridor to win this award and we are very proud of it. Um, we protect professional development and collaboration time. This year we're focused on UDL, PBIS, and MTSS. That's a big focus, but um, student progress discussions are always part of our staff time. Um, and relationships with parents and families allow us to meet the needs of the whole student. We wanna support the home and the school needs as we are able. When we look at takeaways, as we're looking at what are our takeaways from this whole process, Relationships are everything. We're a school family and our parents and community are an important, important part of that extended family. We have to have a whatever it takes attitude. Our students deserve the absolute best and we'll do whatever we need to do to make sure that they, that they get the very best. If something is not working, it's our job to figure it out as a team. We don't have a giant supporting cast, it falls on us. Our core belief is that all students can learn. We've got to think outside the box. We've got to be creative with staffing, resources, and solutions. And we're not afraid to tell our story and ask our community for help. We have high expectations for all students. Students will rise to the level of your expectations. We have genuine compassion and empathy for our students. I think you've heard that loud and clear. When students spend their days in a place where they're loved and cared for, they can do amazing things. It is our job to be champions for our children and their families. And so finally, um, on our continuous path of improvement, um, I've already talked a lot about growing our digital platform. We're gonna continue to participate in relevant professional development and get creative about sourcing those opportunities. We're going to continue developing a school-wide MTSS PBIS framework. I think Trish talked a little bit about that. I don't think we fully understand the magnitude of what that means, but it's something on our list to do. And I think it's going to be immensely helpful. We're going to continue relationships with our community because we know that is the key factor for our success, being integrated in our community, being able to seamlessly go in and out, both in Brennan and beyond, to understand the opportunities and possibilities. And we're gonna to continue to build our professional network and expand our sphere of influence. As we reach out and integrate with others outside of our community, we become a more extended family. And as we shine a light on our little community for those outside of it, we become more visible and we create even more lifelong opportunities for our students. And that ultimately is the goal of our profession. We want our kiddos to be successful, to have happy lives and to go out and find what they wanna do, whatever that may be. We're going to expose them to all kinds of opportunities and experiences so they can consider what they might wanna do and have the courage and stamina to go out and do it. So thank you for coming today to share our story with us. Um, we have enjoyed sharing it with you and hope that it has been helpful in some level. And we'd like now to turn it back over to the Herring Center for the conclusion of this webinar. Great, thank you so much. Um, you know, thank you so much, Brittany. And so well said, I, um, you know, a tremendous, um, get my screen set up, a, um, 
Here, a tremendous thank you to, um, to Brennan uh, K8 for, um, for that really um, inspiring talk. So I'd like to take a minute um, if you can. So let's share in the chat. Um, can you share something that um, you uh, heard about systems, culture, or leadership practices that support inclusive schools? And from what you learned today, what are some initial steps you could take to apply in your own, um, own school building? So take a few minutes and enter that in the chat. And as we're doing that, um, let me just give some uh, additional information. Um, you know, to learn more about our demonstration sites project and OSPI's inclusionary practices, professional development project, please visit these websites or feel free to email us at uwdemosites at uw.edu. Also, as mentioned earlier, there'll be a recording of this website along with artifacts that Brennan provides that you can use as resources in your own um, school community. Um, so please feel free to, to, to take what you've learned today and um, take it back to your school and visit our website by the end of the week to, um, to see this recording, uh, the PowerPoint um, and additional resources. One of the things we like to do as we close is to engage in a collaborative activity. So in one word, what are the systems, culture, and our leadership practices you heard today that support inclusive schools? And if one of my teammates can please put the URL in the chat. Make sure it's activated. See, I can get this unlocked. Okay. Take a minute. Great, I see inspiring grit. Collaboration. I see heart and you see as it's growing, multiple people saying those things over and again. I'm gonna keep this up. Belonging, excellent. Keep those coming. So this is something that we can share again um, um, with, uh, with Brennan um, towards the end. So we'll keep that going and And then, you know, really, again, just um, in closing, uh, thank you to OSPI and CSTEP for their partnership in this project. Another enormous thank you to Brennan K8 for your inspiring work. You know, thanks to all of you for joining us today to learn more about inclusionary practices and for envisioning how you might take some of what you learned today and apply it to your own schools. I have to say, I visited Brennan Washington 15 years ago and watching them shift and change their culture over these years has been just such a tremendous experience um, for me. And, you know, it's hard to really feel Brennan unless you go there and visit and it's an incredible town. And I appreciate them sharing their story and, um, and really all of the shifts and changes they've made in their school culture to really build this uh, family school that really does feel inclusive. So keep um, adding on to the chat. And again, thank you for uh, coming today.